Well, thank you very much, Mario, for that, for that introduction, and uh, to Annie as well for the kind of invitation to, to come. Um, it's a great pleasure to be, to be back in Chicago. I was here, I think, four years ago talking about my translation of Celestina. Uh, I'm going to say something uh, about Catalan and Catalan literature in general before I kind of focus on, on, on the Grey Notebook, because I'm, I'm not sure how much you may be familiar with uh, Catalan culture and literature. Um, Catalan is a, is a romance language which um, goes back to the, to the Middle Ages. Um, there was a very, um, I mean, Ca Catalonia was a very important kingdom uh, within the peninsula, within the Iberian Peninsula in the, uh, in, in the Middle Ages. Um, it kind of, at one stage, dominated trade in the Mediterranean. Uh, jurists in, in Barcelona wrote a maritime law for, the, uh, for, 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 the, for, for sailing on the Mediterranean. And <clears throat> it was a kingdom in which there were five official languages and it was a kingdom where there was a flourishing literature. Um, now, I'm, I'm not going to go into the kind of whole history of uh, <laughs> Catalan literature and language, but I, I, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, that Catalan existed as a flourish, flourishing language, a flourishing culture in, in the Middle Ages, and then it had many kind of ups and downs. Um, uh, and as a literary language, really kind of almost kind of disappeared for, 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 for several centuries until, until the 19th century. It exist, Catalan existed as in written texts, which were mainly kind of religious, religious texts to do with the church. Um, and it survived as a vernacular. It, was, it survived as a language that people spoke in, in their homes and uh, in, their, in, their, in their social life. In the, in, in, in the area of the Iberian Peninsula and of, of France that are now referred to as Els Paisos Catalans, the, the, the kind of the Catalan countries. And these are the, the Balearic Islands, uh, Valencia, obviously Catal Catalonia, and the southwest of France, the kind of Roussillon and around the area, you may have heard of the, the city of, Pe of Perpignan. Um, <coughs> In the, 18, in, the, in the late 18th century, the Catalonia began to kind of redevelop as an important kind of uh, economical, economic space with the development of textile industries, and Barcelona became the Manchester of, uh, of Spain. And with the development of the textile industries became the development of a bourgeoisie, the development of a proletariat, the development of a cultural elite who wanted to um, recreate a literary language known as Catalan. And so they looked back to the Middle Ages, but they, they began to write particularly poetry. The focus was, was, was on poetry. And the Catalan they wrote in was a, a, a rather kind of flowery uh, lang language, and it was a language that was kind of elitist. They, they felt no need to relate the language, the literary language as such, with the vernacular that was being spoken by the people, the, the people who were speaking Catalan in the street and, uh, and in their homes. And that remained the situation. I mean, there were, they organized Jocs Florals, which were like the Welsh I Steadfords poetry competitions. Um, that remained the situation until, until later on in the 19th century, and then there was a development of a more realistic form of real, written kind of realist novels. Um, a writer no, uh, called Narcisse Ullier who wrote kind of long novels about, for instance, one based on a stock exchange crash in Barcelona, La Febrador. Um, until we come to, um, I mean, Platt was writing in, uh, he was born in 1897, and he started writing The Grey Notebook. He wrote The Great Notebook in 1918, 1919. Um, and these, there are, it's basically two years in his life. Um, two years in his life when he was um, uh, studying at the University of Barcelona. He was studying uh, law at the university. And uh, his, his life was divided between Barcelona and Palafrugel. Um, Palafrugel is a, is a town on the coast, on the Costa Brava. You may have heard of the Costa Brava. 
Um, he was on the Costa Brava. He, his family, the small fa farming family, came from a hamlet called um, Llofriu, which was near Palafrugel, which was a town um, on the coast, uh, the, the fishing port called Cavellia de Palafrugel. Uh, just to say something briefly about um, where, where he came from. Palafrugel was an, the important center of the cork industry in, uh, in, in Spain, and cork was an important... Uh, the cork industry was important uh, in the in the 19th century and in, into the 20th century, and it meant essentially that um, Pla uh, grew up in an area where there was always a lot of um, uh, coming and going. There, there were there would people would come from all over Europe to Palafrugel in order to negotiate deals with um, buying cork. So it's buying and selling cork. And uh, there was a lively social life in terms of cafes. This was oh, oh, clearly this, this would be a very male-dominated thing. Men would meet in, in cafes, and they would talk about politics, literature. Um, so it wasn't a. I mean, he came from the countryside, but it wasn't a rural backwater. It was somewhere that which had this kind of. It had this industry, uh, the cork industry, and it also had the. There was a. The, it was a fishing port, so there was, the, the fishing trade was there as well. Um, I'll just read, he wrote this about um, his generation. My generation thought there was no conflict between writing things that people understood and being a writer. For historical reasons, the people is bilingual. Schooling is in Spanish. Most inhabitants of the linguistic area, as they call it, speak Catalan. What you hear is genuine, normal Catalan. What is written and read is a different kettle of fish. There is a sense of inhibition, of writing with something that is inferior and that leads to a Catalan that is arid. Uh, the Grey Notebook is, the, is in, in one sense, is the portrait of the writer as a young man. This, he's 21, 22, and he doesn't want to be a lawyer. He wants to be a writer. And the issue is, what kind of Catalan am I going to write? Um, am I going to write in this tradition that goes back to the Renaissance in the, 18, in, the, in, the, in the 19th century that was continued by a, a group of writers who called Nocentistas who wrote this kind of elaborate, florid uh, Catalan that was uh, aimed at a restricted elite readership? Or am I going to kind of move beyond that to make Catalan, in, to, to, to make a literary Catalan that is kind of available to a much wider 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 readership and in in his life in 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 Palafrugel, as it's reflected in this book um, you can see that he 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 was a, an habitué as his father was of the cafes and there was this thing that is known in in spanish and catalan as a tertulia where where kind of men come together and they they talk about everything under the sun and many of the entries in this in the diaries here are records of some of these discussions. They may be about um, politics, they may be about underpants, they may be about um, the, the First World War, the stock market, they can, they can uh, about women, about the church, they kind of range over. Uh, they may be about literature. They have discussions about Jean-Jacques Rousseau, for instance, in, in, one of the, in, one, in one of the passages. And they're very lively, very kind of lively. Um, ex exchanges and very and, and very humorous. Uh, he goes to Barcelona, and in Barcelona he's at the university, and he hates the university because in the university the the kind of pedagogic uh, model is that of rote learning. You you are given chapters of books. To, your 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 professor reads chapters of books out. Um, you are supposed to learn chapters by heart, and then in the exams you regurgitate the necessary paragraphs to answer the question that is put. Um, there's no sense of it being a stimulus to the intellect or to the imagination. And apart from experiences of real life that were there in Palafrugel and Barcelona to stimulate him, his consciousness as a would-be writer, there was a gentleman's club uh, called the Athenaeum, Al Ateneo, in, in, in Barcelona, and he, he kind of joined up, he became a member of the Ateneo, and he went to a club there, which was run by a man called uh, Joaquim Burayeras. And basically, uh, there are a number of, a lot of entries in the, in the diary that deal with the kind of discussions that went on in, the, in, the, in this gentleman's club, 
And again, the, the kind of, it's, a, it's a much greater range than in Palafrugel, much more kind of literary discussions, um, but um, very, 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 very lively. And one of the key discussions as far as Platt was concerned is, you know, what am I going to write? And he, he got no stimulus from the university. Um, perhaps I'll, I'll just read um, a passage. Uh, there are some very, very funny descriptions of his lectures at the university. Um, and this, this is a description of, uh, or part of the description of lecture, his lectures in philosophy, which were called the fundamentals of logic. And he makes a lot of jo jokes about how fundamental they really were. Um, so, uh, Senor Sanso said the professor in his, uh, in his mellifluous Spanish, today we are doing Kant's theories, or Rousseau's. Tell me about Kant's theory. What do you know about Kant's theory? The student stood up, opened the syllabus, shifted his body slightly so his ear was better positioned to hear his prompter, the students used to help each other, on the next door bench, wet his lips, scratched the nape of his neck and came out with drivel. The prompter that day, for whatever reason, was a dreadful prompter. He was a failed prompter. A tense silence reigned in the lecture theater. In the meantime, Senor Arana, and of course Arana is a, is a kind of an interesting name because Arana um, is Arania, means spider, and then una rana is a, is a frog. So, I mean, whether that would, that may be a made up name, you know. Um, uh, Senor Arana glanced at his student register through the gold rimmed spectacles on the end of his nose. Finally, the wet fish of a student, to describe him accurately, confessed. I had no time to study, he said, looking distressed, oppressed, and completely at a loss. So, Senor so and so, the professor replied, not at all sourly, smoothing his mustache, as if he were commenting on the, fe on the weather. You don't know Kant's theory, but I expect you know how to refute it. Now be so good as to refute Kant's theory. As the prompters were a waste of time, sometimes a Holy Spirit arose from the most unlikely corner of the lecture theater to help the person question uh, survive. The student heard various noises behind him, what is known as rhubarb rhubarb, and began to stammer. Senor Arana immediately struck the pose of a man who is completely entranced. He wiped his chin as if he was stroking a goat's nipple. The rhubarb rhubarb made sense, and the student bore up. The professor listened with growing admir admiration. The amazing scene always ended with a professorial comment. You didn't know the theory, but you did manage to refute it. That is quite an achievement. I don't think high culture has ever scaled such heights as those exemplified by these absolutely authentic scenes. Uh, so that was the experience of, 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 of the university. And in, in uh, the Ateneo, uh, there, were, the, there were two were two, two people he kind of really connected with. One was Kim Bollareras, the man that kind of led the, 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 the kind of group, the club. And then there was um, Alexandra Plana. And Alexandra Plana was, was a writer. And he had kind of really detailed discussions with, with Pla about what kind of stuff he should be writing. One of his first pieces of advice to Pla was to translate. He said, if you want to be a writer, then it's a good idea to do something really serious in the literary, in, 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 uh, the literary uh, world, and that is translation. So he recommended to Plow that, that he should begin the translation of Les Cornifleurs, a novel by Jacques Renard, Jacques Renard the, Fre the French writer. And uh, there are some kind of illuminating comments by Plat on, on his process of translating, about how it, it was teaching him to use his own language. Um, and also what a, what a kind of a scholarly pursuit it was because he had to kind of use a lot of dictionaries and he had to do research in order to make the translation of Renard. So uh, that, 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 that they're kind of, uh, kind of an, an interesting comment on, on the, um, the source of the encouragement that was coming, intellectual encouragement that was coming to Plow that uh, in, translation was important. And then um, Pla had written some stuff as a 14-year-old for local newspapers, you know, a kind of description of the fiestas or description of, you know, sunset over the Mediterranean or whatever or the, the sound of a woodpecker. And, and the, he wrote kind of vignettes and these were published in local newspapers and he took them to Alexander Planner and Alexander Planner said, you know, these, these are all very well, but it's all this kind of no sentista, it's all kind of rather flowery and, and this is not what we need. Now, um, 
Paul Valéry, the French, the French poet, he gave a lecture in 1924 at the, in, in, at the Ateneo, and he, he told the Catalans there, he said, look, if you want Catalan to, be, to survive as a language and as a literary language, then it must be, the focus mustn't be solely on poetry, because this was the tendency. He said, you must write novels, you must write prose that can be read by a large number of people. Otherwise, what will happen with Catalan, literary Catalan is what, what happened to Provencal, it kind of disappears and it becomes a very small, a, a kind of small activity. Um, so I'll read another passage where, uh, of, of this a conversation that he records between um, himself and, and Planner. He says, we must ad adhere to a minimum of intelligibility, clarity, and simplicity. We must not be so tremendously vain as to wish to rebuff the people who approach our books or magnify the headaches and problems they already have. The moment hasn't yet arrived. We are a long ways off to make a minority, to make minority literature. We must like, make a literature for everybody. Minority literature isn't necessarily, sim necessarily good simply because it is so. One experiences so many disappointments on that front. In any case, let's leave such minority literature to languages that are sophisticated and developed. Ours isn't. And then Plan goes on. I thought at length about everything Alexander Planner said in this conversation, which inevitably I have much abridged. I must confess that what he said really struck home. I tore up sheaves of paper, everything I'd written over all those years with, with such difficulty in no sentista style, shall we say, as one way of describing it. As soon as I could... Uh, as soon as I could, I started writing this notebook, the grey notebook. It was the natural consequence of the destruction of all that paper. It is never great fun tearing up your own efforts, particularly when you have worked hard at them, uh, as in my case. But I did so, and with little hesitation. I'm sure it was the right thing to do, at least as far as I was concerned. Okay. So, um, he... <clears throat> the, the, so there is this strand in the grey notebook which is about becoming a writer and what language am I going to, to speak. And of course, it's in a sense, you could say that all young writers have this conversation. I mean, what, what, how are we going to differ from what's gone before? But in a context of a language that is, is not the language of education, that is the language of a, of a country that is stateless, of a culture that is stateless, then it has, you know, it can, I think it has more resonances. Um, uh, and one of the one of the kind of aspects of, of Catalan culture is that, um, uh, as we you know were saying last night with Basque culture, is that it's a culture that looks outwards. It looks out to the sea, towards the rest of the world. It tends to be it's kind of co cosmopolitan. Platt, when he was at university in Barcelona, decided to go to the Italian Institute, so he learned Italian. He already knew French. Why did he know French? Because Palafrugel is quite in Barcelona, in fact, is quite close to the French border. He, must, he learned French at school, but it, it, French was in the atmosphere. It was, in the, it, it was something that people took on board. It's like you know, people often living near frontiers, they, they kind of learn, as a matter of fact, several languages. So he, and, and then he, there's a letter here that he wrote to the poet Carlos Riba in 1927, and he says, Psychologically, I'm a loner and a man who likes to live on the periphery. The word I, mo I most like is out. What I like about it, is he uses the English word out. And he, had a, he, had a, he was fascinated by English literature and he, he learned English. So he learned English and he learned German. So he was kind of, you know, within the European context, he, he had a kind of broad spread of languages and he read uh, in those languages. Uh, as well as reading kind of works works in translation. Now, I should say something. He wrote this in 1918, 1919, but it wasn't published until 1966. Um, now, why did it ta take so long? Well, firstly, I think the obvious uh, reason is he was dealing with, uh, with people who were alive. He's uh, very frank, very sincere, in what he kind of writes, he, 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 he's no fear. Of, I mean, he kind of says what he thinks with, well. Um, so the, many things, he would, he would not want these to be, you know, the, the, he would like people to be dead, one thinks, before he would kind of publish the grey notebook because 
It's, it's a diary, it's an autobiography, and he wouldn't want to hurt people's feelings. Um, and then the historical reasons, uh, the Civil War. 1936-39, uh, the, the, the Civil War, and what does that mean? It means that uh, from 1939, it's really impossible to publish in Catalan. Um, and it doesn't become possible to really publish in a major way until, 19, until the middle 60s, even though Franco was still alive. There were kind of periods when the regime opened up slightly, there was pressure from the rest of the world and so on. And uh, the Grey Notebook was published in 1966. And kind of like at the same time, the, the translation to Spanish was published by the, by the poet Dionisio Rirejo and his, and his wife. And, and this public, it was the first volume of his complete works. There were 46 volumes of his complete works and in Catalan. And these, the, the Grey Notebook was the first volume of his complete works. So really in this period, from 1939 until kind of 1966, he, he was writing in Spanish. He wrote for a journal called Destino, which was a bit like Paris Match. It was kind of uh, between Paris Match and uh, uh, Le Nouvel Observateur, if you know. If you know. It, was a, it was a kind of, it, ca it had kind of vaguely Jesuit origins, um, but it was a critical um, weekly magazine with lots of kind of photo, fo photos and so on, and news stories. And he wrote every, more or less every week for that in Spanish. Um, and he wrote in a Spanish that was quite uh, Catalanized um, deliberately. Um, and his, his articles were heavily censored by the Francoist, uh, by the, by the Francoist censors. Um, but whilst he was involved in this activity, he, he was writing um, his complete works. Um, and, you know, this being Pla, this being Catalonia, um, a, a culture that's been oppressed, we don't know everything about all of these processes. It would be fascinating to know a lot about these processes, but we don't know, for instance, how much he changed the Grey Notebook from what was written in 1918-1919 and what um, was published in 1966. It, um, those studies haven't been kind of carried out, and there's a kind of debate. There are those who say that he kind of heavily revised, and there are those that say he kind of the, the revision is quite. He, he kind of revised it over three weeks, and it was, it was quite light. Let me say something about Pla after the Grey Notebook. In, at the end of the Grey Notebook, he finishes university degree, and he goes to France to work as a journalist. His contacts at the Athenaeum had already got him work as a journalist in Barcelona, so he was writing for the newspapers in, in Barcelona, and then he went to, to Paris as the French correspondent of a, a, a Catalan newspaper. And really from 19, the, the, the next 10 years, he was a foreign correspondent in, for, for, the news, for, for, for one or two newspapers, Barcelona, across Europe. He was in Germany during the, the period of the rise of Hitler, the period of hyperinflation. He was in, he was in the UK. He was in uh, Russia. He, went, he spent five weeks in Russia in 1925 writing a series of articles for La Publicitat on the, the new economic policy and the state of the revolution in Russia. Um, he, he covered Mussolini's march on Rome. Um, I mean, he, he, was a, he was a journalist covering kind of important events across Europe. And he's a figure I, I, I compare to Joseph Roth, the, the, the German writer, really. Um, he has many things in common, his kind of sense of humor, uh, his, fa his fondness for food and alcohol, and always being hard up and never having enough money. You know? So he has those things in, uh, in common with Platt. And also this being an outsider, not, not being part. He, he wasn't part of the literary establishment in Barcelona. Um, he may have gone to the Athenaeum, and he, he met many of the people in the, in the Athenaeum, but he was from this kind of rural, rural background. He wasn't from a family that was kind of part of the, 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 the kind of important families of, of, of Catalonia, and he wasn't the son of an important writer or a famous musician or, 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 or whatever. So he wrote, um, during the 1920s, a series of, uh, uh, a series of, sh of short stories uh, and, and these have been collected in a book that, that, that called La Vida Amarga. Um, there are three stories, very fine stories, set in Berlin, a uh, story in Monte Carlo, a uh, story in Glasgow, a story in Leeds. Now, this is very unusual 
in, in the peninsula. You won't find, the, I don't think, I mean, you may, I may, you, uh, may be wrong, but I don't think there is a significant kind of set of short stories written by, in Spanish about the, what was happening in Europe uh, from, that, from this period. Um, anyway, um, uh, this will be published by Archipelago in April. Um, I'm just kind of dealing with the final, the final proofs. Um, these are the first translations of Josette Platt in, into English. And uh, uh, I, I kind of came to translating Catalan literature kind of late on as a translator. I've translated a lot of Spanish literature, and I only started translating Catalan in sort of 2003, 2004. And uh, I hadn't read any of this literature before. And I'm a Hispanist. I studied French literature also at, at Cambridge. and, and, and uh, one of, one of the things that, I mean, for, for me as a translator, it, is it really has been a revelation to translate these writers who I didn't know existed. You know, I consider myself to be a scholar of the Spanish scene, I mean, or in the Latin American scene. But I think my position kind of reflects the position of many Hispanists, that they, they're, not, they're not aware of the, these important writers um, who were writing in Catalan, simply because they were writing in Catalan. And they are kind of, there is a, there is a certain silence over, the, over these writers. There are one or two exceptions. Um, but um, they're not a, they're not, they, 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 they don't have a signif the significance that they should have within the teaching of, uh, of, of Hispanic literatures. I mean, more is known about the Latin American writers in Spain than the writers of Catalonia. And yet, you know, paradoxically, Barcelona is really the center of the publishing industry in Spain. Um, so it's, 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 it's been, uh, I, you know, I, 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 I always say to, to colleagues, you know, kind of why is it that in Cambridge, in the 1960s, when I was studying Spanish literature, that Catalan, we weren't, we, it wasn't, we weren't, we weren't made to read, to, to kind of learn Catalan as part of learning, you know, as part of being becoming familiar with the the Spanish scene. Um, I've just uh, another translation of mine has just come out called Un "Uncertain Glory," which is like a major novel of the Spanish Civil War by Juan by Juan Salas. Um, and again, I think, well, how is it that you know readers don't know "Uncertain Glory"? They've read, you know, Hemingway and they read Orwell, but this kind of major major Civil War novel written in Catalan is until, until um, it was translated by David Rosenthal, but had a, it was kind of published in a, in, a, um, in, a, in a way that was very restricted in terms of distribution. So my translation is the first one that has kind of had, has really kind of had visibility. Um, so I, I feel that, that um, uh, we need to kind of rethink the teaching of, uh, of Spanish literature, of Spanish literatures in, 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 in the universities um, to incorporate uh, uh, Catalan, Catalan writing and Basque writing and Galician writing uh, with, as, as if it, was, it should be not the peripheral, but it should be kind of mainstream. It shouldn't be an option. It should be something that's included in, um, within, within the mainstream for, for, for students. And obviously, in terms of, you know, there's a lot of discussion now about world literature. Um, I, um, there as well, I think that, that, that there has to be kind of space for... For, for, for Catalan writing in, in translation. Um, I don't know um, what more that um, I, I can kind of say at this stage in terms of, uh, of, the, of the Grey Notebook. I think that um, it's, 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 a, it's a very skillfully written uh, book in the sense that he writes about a number of uh, writers, Catalan writers, um, and his descriptions of what they're doing. Um, I'll, I'll read one. Josep Carnet was a poet, and he says, Last winter in Barcelona, Joan Climent reminded me how refined and delightful Carnet's writing is. It is more than that. Carnet is a great poet. He is one in the technical sense, I would say, of the school exercise. At this level, he is a huge writer, probably one of the greatest in our writing. This last claim of mine can only be understood by taking into account that Carnet works with a Catalan language that lacks literary form, that is poor, inflexible, ossified, lexically restricted, riddled with corruptions, bone dry, 
and marked by an orthographical anarchy that the country's elite, intellectual elite, continues to defend, a language developing in a sprawling, chaotic city, Barcelona that is, to the indifference of a large swathe of the population, and the heart of a human mass that possesses not so much a diamond edge as a purely biological power of absorption, the aspirations of a gigantic sponge. In this sense, the, lang the Catalan language is a permanent tragedy. And, it, and he kind of writes about uh, many, many of his contemporaries in, in this way, that there's a comment on the state of Catalan literature and language as a whole, and also it's part of his kind of working out where he's going as a writer. But this, this kind of uh, tension between are we writing for an elite or are we writing for the mass of the population? Are we writing in a, in a language that is exemplary or are we writing the language that we feel is necessary for the work that we want to create? This is a constant tension in, in Catalan literature and it's a tension that is there today because really after the, the Civil War, uh, you have uh, this, the, this kind of very difficult period when t well, two to three generations of Catalans again have this experience that they, they can speak Catalan at home, but they can't speak it in the street. They can't speak it at school. Their teachers can't uh, teach them in Catalan. And indeed, in some schools, if, 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 pu if pupils happen to say something in Catalan, they would be severely punished um, by, the, by, by their teachers. So you have this kind of situation where you move, because of the Civil War, from, a, from, from the 1920s and 30s, when Catalan literature reached a very high point, um, it goes to this other extreme where, it's again, it's driven into a corner, it's driven underground. And it's driven underground, you know, by and large, from, from 1939 to, to the mid-60s, when things began to, began to change. But even in, even in the mid-60s, uh, there was no education tuition in, in Catalan, and it was still difficult speaking Catalan in the streets, and there were no Catalan newspapers, and that, that existed until 19, 1975. And I think that that, you know, that, that kind of um, uh, the, 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 the post-dictatorship um, experience has meant that um, for writers, um, for many writers have, deci have decided that when, you know, after the death of Franco, <laughs> that really their role was to reassume this role of the, the kind of preservers of the language. They had to kind of recreate the language, but they had to recreate the language going back to the more elitist forms. And, 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 the, and, the, and the Catalan literary establishment really reinforced that. And I'll give you an a couple of examples. There is, a, um, there is a, an equivalent of the uh, Real Academia or the Royal Academy, um, in Catalan, which is the Institut d'Estudis Catalans. And it has a dictionary, um, which is like the, the kind of uh, the standard dictionary, monolingual dictionary in Catalan. And it's a normalizing dictionary. So non-standard forms of Catalan of the Lexis are not in there. Um, as a translator, it's when well, I find that dictionary pretty hopeless because I look up words that, that, that Pla uses from his village. When he'll use a, a word that describes a vine leaf that is used in his village and nowhere else. And, you know, it's, it's not in the, the Institut de Studies Catalans dictionary, nor will they use words that are, that, that, that are kind of carries, that, that carries over or calcs on, on Castilian because they're not pure. Because th there is a, you know, there is a pure Catalan word that has been, a word that's been invented for, say, I don't know, uh, um, some new piece of technology, technological equipment, um, but it, it will be a word that is used by a small uh, elite of Catalans, but the majority of Catalans will use some other word that's a calc on the Spanish. And, and uh, there are those writers who kind of think that they have to write in that way. They have to write in that restricted way and not draw on the kind of Catalan as a vernacular language, the Catalan that's developing all around them in the streets, and in that very confused mess that is the community that, and the society that for hundreds of years has been a bilingual, trilingual society. Um, uh, and, and I think that it's only now in the, in, in, in the last kind of 10 or 15 years that there's a new generation of, of, of younger writers who are, who are kind of bringing the Catalan from the streets and. Uh, and beyond into, in, in, into their writing. But it's a constant tension in, 
in, in, the, in the Catalan situation. And there is, it's a very strong idea that you have to write an exemplary form of Catalan. Don't write the Catalan that you feel you, you, know, you want to write as a writer, but you must kind of um, write this kind of, you know, a normalized, controlled, restrained uh, Catalan. Uh, and my wife, Teresa Solana, is a, is a noir writer. She's written kind of six noir books. And, and I think this, it's, it's, it, this is a, a good... Uh, um, there, is a, there is a famous um, series of, of uh, noir in translation, La Cue de Paya, which um, uh, came out in the kind of, I don't know, seven, 70, after Franco's death, you know, kind of, and, and in the 80s, like Dashiell Hammett, uh, Raymond Chandler, all the kind of great American noir writers were translated into Catalan. And they were tra a, lot of, a lot of the translations were done by, by writers. Um, and it was, it's a very important series, and it, was, it, it had a big impact. Uh, but if you look at these translations, everybody speaks the same kind of language. The crooks speak the same as the doctors. There's no, there's no, there's no kind of differenti differentiation in terms of class or social register. They all speak this correct Catalan. So it, 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 it sort of sounds... Um, uh, it, it, it reads very oddly today. And, and uh, my wife, Teresa, she, and Najat al-Hashmi is another writer who comes from a Moroccan background, um, are some of the writers who are trying to bring in the kind of street Catalan into, into, into their novels. And I know that they, they have battles with the, when it comes to the editing process. The editors want to take out these words, and they say it's not in the dictionary. And you say, you know, and, and Teresa will say, yeah, it's not in the dictionary, but everybody uses it every day. And, um, so, so that uh, the, the, the struggle, the intellectual struggle, the, the struggle that was going on in the mind of Platt, the young writer, between these kind of, these two poles, the elitist pole or the kind of, the more, the more kind of vernacular realistic uh, Paul, are, are still very present in, in Catalan writing today. Um, so I'll stop there and let's, let's have questions. Um, do you have any questions? <laughs> I'd like to know how you came to write the book and how did you, did you put it forward for translation? No, I didn't, no. No, I... I, I um, <coughs> when, I, when I went to live in Barcelona, I, in 2000... And, uh, three, I, I, I decided that I would go back every year to the London Book Fair in order to, to kind of maintain a visibility with English publishers. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of my appointments at the Book Fair was with Edwin Frank, the, uh, who runs the, the kind of classic series at the NYLB. And uh, I had a meeting with him, and he, you know, I had my w w translators, we have our wish list of books we want to translate. And I had a wish list, and I gave a number of books to him, titles. And I never heard back from him in a, in a year. And then the following year, I went to the book fair, and we had another appointment. And the first thing he said, he says, why don't you translate this book, Tirano Banderas, by Bali and Clan, which had been on my list I gave in the previous year. He'd obviously kind of sussed it out, and the, the, you know, got positive feedback. And so I started, I got a contract, and I translated uh, Tyrant Banderas. And while I was translating Tyrant Banderas, he wrote me an email and he said, why? What about the Grey Notebook? El Quadern Greece, we just signed up the Grey Notebook. Now, I hadn't read the Grey Notebook, and I had never read anything by Platt. And, and I said to my wife, I said, well, you know, I've just had this kind of um, email from Edwin, and he says, do you know anybody who could translate the, the Quadern Greece? And I said to my wife, well, do you think I would like it? Because I always read a book before I translate it. And she said, no, it's, this is a masterpiece. You, you'd really love it. So I didn't even read it. I, I just kind of emailed him back and said, <laughs> I said, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I want to translate it. And I got a contract and, uh, you know, many, many, many happier months, happier months I spent translating Josette Plan. Um, do, do you have the situation with the Catalan language is anything like Catalonia so and the Rocky Sea in Greece? Uh, also the questions of national identity Oh yes, very, very, very much so. Um, in fact, so, yeah, somebody was saying that last night. I, I think it's very similar to the, to to the Greek situation. Um, I think with, uh, with 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 Catalan, it's it's kind of uh, there's a heavy class element in it. 
and the, and there are, and there was it with in Greece. Yes, I think that uh, um, there's the issue of I don't know in in, in Greece, but there's not so much. I mean, there's the, there's the pressure from Spanish from the Spanish Empire, if you like, the, the colonizer. But the other the other issue in Catalonia is migration. You know, because you have the migration of um, well, particularly, I mean, in the 19th century, with the development of the textile industry, um, there were a lot of uh, migrants came from, from Andalusia and from Murcia, from the south of Spain, and also from Galicia, to, to Barcelona and to Catalonia along the coast there to work in the textile factories. And these people came um, not knowing Catalan. They were speaking Spanish. And, there were, um, and after the Civil War in the 19... In, in the 1950s, when industry began to pick up in in in, in Barcelona and uh, and in Catalonia, what happened then? Well, of course, um, there was dire poverty in the south of Spain, and so um, there was the movement of mig of migration from the south of Spain to to Germany, to England, and to France, but also to to Barcelona and also to the Basque Country. And for the Catalan elite, this this represented a threat. The the, the migrant workers were like a threat, and it was a threat that was kind of um, orchestrated by Franco, um, so that, that that was a very that I mean, and if you I mean, you won't know that I mean Jordi Pujol, who was the the kind of president, the Catalan president for many years. I mean, his his wife used to make terrible racist speeches against the the migrants, um, who on the whole, I mean, the the migrants have actually kind of integrated kind of quite quite well into into Catalan Catalan society. Um, and now in, in Barcelona, if you look at the, the famous area of Barcelona, it's the red light district, the ba what is called you know, the Barrio Chino, the, the, ba the Valle Chino, that, that, that area is now uh, an area that where, where Arabic, is, uh, Arabic is, the, is, the, is the kind of main, ma main language. And if you go to the, the Rambla del Raval, I mean, I, I translate this writer called Juan Goytisolo, who lives in Marrakesh. And when he comes to Barcelona, he stays in the Hotel Oriente, a historic hotel on the, on the Ramblas. But he loves to go down to the Rambler behind the more touristy Rambler, which is the Rambler del Raval. And he says, well, when I'm sitting there, I think I'm in Marrakesh. Because you have the, the, uh, a lot of Moroccans, uh, Tunisians, but particularly Moroccans, and they, they dress as they would dress in Marrakesh or Tanger. And, 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 the, and the, the, the cafes are, 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 they, they are, are kind of very much like the, the cafes in, in, in Morocco. And so, I mean, the, and also there's a lot, there's a lot of migration from Africa into Catalonia, from from Senegal and the west coast of Africa, and there there are racist movements in 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 in, in, in Catalonia, um, but I think that um, as a whole, Catalonia has been has kind of been very receptive of of, of migrant workers. But this this Catalan elite that wants to defend the purity of the race and the purity of the language. Um, are not welcoming. They don't welcome the, mi the migrants on the whole. But you have to think that, you know, obviously in Catalonia there's, there have been strong socialist and anarchist political movements that are kind of open and receptive. Sorry. Yeah, no, I'm just wondering, um, so Pa was somebody who thought about language a lot and had all these conversations. As yes. Explained. So is that something that you think about when you translate him? I mean, is there a way in which his language needs to be translated differently from other translation work that you do, or, or as a more general question, I mean, how, how are all your translations different or similar, or I mean, what, what's the um, set of tools that are available right. for you to address these things? Well, I think that I, as a translator, I, I hope that my, all my translations don't sound like Peter Bush. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the idea, I mean, the, the challenge for the translator is to, is, to, is to translate the specific originality of the style of, of each, each author. And so I think that in the whole kind of process of drafting, redrafting, editing, self-editing, and rereading of the original, you, you're kind of kind of trying to hone down into your, into your English to kind of to, produ to recreate what is the, origi the originality of, of, the, of, the, of the writer. Um, I mean, if, I don't know if, you, if Juan Goytisolo, for instance, is a writer who um, is very experimental. I mean, he has books in which there are no um, no capital letters. There are no kind of ordinary sentences. There may be kind of a series of phrases with colons um, and very very dense language. Well, I try to recreate that dense language in uh, in my in my English, 
And with PLA, um, I think that um, the challenge with PLA is, I mean, although, you know, as I've been describing this, this kind of tension uh, in, in the kind of debate about writing in, Ca in Catalan, I mean, it's not as if it's kind of like um, simple, simple reading. I mean, it, it, I mean, he writes. There, are, there. Are, he was very much influenced by by Montaigne, and, and there are the, there are kind of meditative passages, uh, like like short essays, or there are aphorisms, and these are, I found those very difficult to translate um, because they're very they're, they're 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 very focused and they're very spare, and the thoughts are very subtle and. Uh, and on, on the other hand, he, 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 was, he was a lover of the, of the, of the physical senses, of the, sen the kind of the food, the, the sun, the sea, trees, flowers. I mean, he, he's, he's, he's very, uh, has these very, very beautiful descriptions of sort of impressionistic descriptions, and they were extreme. I mean, I had, when, when I... When I'd finished my final edit, I had to go back to all these descriptions of sunsets and and food and and rework them. I wasn't happy with them, um, and particularly because I'd never translated authors who'd written in that way before. I mean, I think that again, part of discovering uh, yourself, you have to recreate yourself as a translator with 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 some writers because you're finding an originality that you've never come across before, and you have to work at it. It doesn't just happen like that. Um, and you have to recognize that perhaps you, 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 you need to develop yourself in writing in, in a way that you haven't written before. Uh. I think I like the of uh, Mario uh, Moschino when he uses uh, the London Bridge. Yes. What's a quote for him? So. Yeah, the musical <laughs> score. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that he yes. <laughs> well, I would say. Yes. Well, I, I, th <laughs> I mean, I think yeah, definitely. The, the, I mean. You make all these hundreds of thousands of choices, and nobody else would make those choices in the same way. And we have, and we have different linguistic repertoires um, within our own language, and and that, that these are reflected in the in our translations. And but I think a lot of that um, is hidden, as it is hidden with original writers, because uh, you know I know I know through I mean I've translated a lot of Juan Goiti Solo, and I you know we're friends, and I know him very well. And I know that there are certain words that have certain personal associations with him, and I know what those personal associations are. But most, most readers of his books don't know about that. And it's the same with my translations. I mean, there are words that I use um, which have very particular things. I mean, I, give, I can give you a couple of examples. I mean, they're, they're pretty stupid, really. But uh, No, they're not stupid. But um, um, when my father died at my, at my, my funeral... Um, uh, my, my my father was cremated, and uh, my my mother, you know, burst into tears, and and afterwards she said to me, I don't know what people thought of me. I was such a sobbing mass, and this kind of phrase, a, a sobbing mass, really. I mean, it's kind of quite striking. And I've used that in my, you know, I've used that in one or two of my translations where I thought it was appropriate, and and clearly that that has very personal associations for me. Um, but nobody else would kind of kind of know know that know what that resonance was. Um, then you know the, the other side of it is that you you perhaps have adjectives, particular adjectives that you use a lot, mm -hmm. and you use too much, or verbs, and so you have to kind of you know go, I always go through when I, when I'm one of my drafts, and I will kind of look out for these words that I know I like, <laughs> <laughs> and make sure that um, I, I kind of I'm not overusing them. I, I think the music, I mean, I, I kind of made that kind of an analogy with music, but I think it, it's not, it's often a, an analogy that's used, but I don't, the, the issue is there that music isn't words. And the thing about words is that everybody uses words. 
So it's kind of slightly dif different. Uh, because ev everybody uses words, and therefore everybody thinks that they, they, you know, they have a right to opinions about words. Um, whereas with music, it, it's more difficult. You know, um, you know, you can hear a Beethoven string quartet, and then you can express an opinion about a Beethoven string quartet, but it's much more difficult than expressing an opinion about, you know, my translation of the Grey Notebook, uh, because that music is kind of it's kind of more abstract in a way. Um, um, so I think it, it kind of is an it's, it's a kind of limited thing. Um, I'll just read that the, this is what he wrote in 1940 because often Platt is attacked for being, you know, he was a spy for Franco. A book has just been published, like Platt as spy as Franco's spy. Fact is, he was like a in the first years of the Second Republic, he supported the Republic. And then he was kind of, he had death threats from anarchists and so on. And uh, he went into exile. He went to Marseille and he was in Biarritz. And he was, he was mixing with right-wing Catalans who were also were, were exiled. And uh, he, he met his, his, I think it was his first, first wife, a Norwegian. She was a, she, were, she actually was a fascist spy. Um, so he, he was living with this, with this fascist spy. And, and, uh, uh, and then when he he went back to to Barcelona in 1939, when you know kind of when at the end of the civil war, um, and he was offered the editorship of La Vanguardia, the, the main kind of newspaper of Barcelona, and he kind of lasted there very 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 short period because he, you know, he couldn't stand the fact that Catalan was a, was suppressed and he had spent all his time writing Catalan, and so he he went into a form of internal exile. He went to back to the fa the family farm. And he, he kind of went to, um, and, and he wrote there, and he worked on his, on his books and so on. But he wrote this in 1940. The club at the Athenaeum has disappeared. No books in Catalan are published. Everything has been demolished and uh, hidden away. The country has a state-controlled economy. The crooks are in control. The atmosphere is specifically totalitarian Catholic. Uh, in, in, in the area of, of, uh, of Francoism, we generally read Le Monde. Nobody reads newspapers published in Catalonia, let alone in Madrid. They all say the same things. There's no genuine news. They're unbelievably boring, and the journalists are all bought men. You know, that, that's what he wrote in Well, <laughs> yeah, but compared to the 1930s when, you know, there was this kind of very lively intellectual debate going on. Yeah? Sorry. Sure. A Native American. That's an interesting phrase. Uh, <laughs> No, I know what you mean, but I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, you could call me, I'm a native Englishman, you know, I mean, that. <laughs> um, well, this was edited by, I mean, it's New York Review of Books, so it's an American publication, and the, 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 it's got American spelling, and there are, some Ameri there are some American phrases, but on the whole, it has an English voice, and I'm sure that if an American translator had translated it, it would be different. Uh, hmm? It would be different anyway, yes. But you'll find, and, and um, I, I kind of have no, I mean, I, I'm not anti-American English. I'm not anti-UK English. I, I'm not, but there are readers and there are critics and there are publishers who are. I mean, for instance, um, Uncertain Glory has come out with the McElhose Press, which is a UK press. And the owner of the uh, great publisher, Christopher McElhose at the McElhose Press, he hates American English. You know, so I gave him a copy of this, and he was re he read it, and he sent me an email and said, Plow is a wonderful writer. It's a pity about the American English. <laughs> um, and when he gets Edith Grossman's translations, I mean, he kind of, you know, massacres them. He kind of takes out the American English as much as he can, and Edith Grossman can't stand it. Um, but that, you know... And, I've met that with one or two kind of American editors that they don't like, kind of. And I say, really, 
when you're translating writing of this level, you know, the readers are used to all kinds of English. We, you know, we see American films, you see British films. You know, what I do, I was staying with a friend, Katie Silver, in San Francisco, and I get there and, I, and they say, oh, we're going to watch Downton Abbey. <laughs> I mean, and I find that people are watching just the same series in San Francisco as we're watching in Oxford in the UK. <laughs> um, <coughs> so I think that, um, uh, yes, there will be differences. There are differences. But, I mean, there are great Australian translator, translators and, and I, read, I read their translations and I enjoy them. I mean, I, I like... You know, I like, I've, I've translated Cuban Spanish, Uruguayan Spanish, Mexican Spanish, Spanish Spanish. Uh, and, and uh, you know, the, there are differences, there are nuances. It means that you have to do research on kind of particularly with, I mean, I've translated Brazilian, uh, Rio Carioca, Rio uh, Portuguese, um, Brazilian Portuguese. You know, all of these um, kind of national kind of languages have specific, have their specificity and the differences in grammar, differences in vocabulary, and you have to kind of research these and, and make sure you don't kind of drop a clanger. But, um, you know, I mean, there are ways that translators can deal, can deal with that, um, and, we deal, and, and we deal with it. Well, on the whole, um, I, I translate for trade, you know, trade publishers, and they don't, they don't like footnotes. And on the whole, I don't like footnotes. I, I think I, I always point to the Bodley Head Ulysses, not a footnote in sight. You know, people read that, and then there, of course, you know, there are all those books on Joyce that you can read if you want to. But every time I go back to read Ulysses, I read it in the text that's not annotated. And I think that, you know, kind of works of literature should function in that way. I mean, if you consider A Hundred Years of Solitude, A Hundred Years of Solitude is a kind of mass, you know, it's kind of really kind of massive bestseller throughout the world. Yet a Colombian will read A Hundred Years of Solitude in a way that, uh, um, you know, the, the average English reader or the average Indian reader in, in Delhi or the average Spanish reader won't read because all of the kind of very, you know, kind of very specific references to Colombian history and culture or even plant life, yeah, I mean, they, 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 they won't kind of get them. Um, but it doesn't make any difference because it's the narrative kind of works and the language works beyond, beyond those kind of specific things. I think with Platt, we, we kind of did have a discussion about whether the book needed, and because there are so, you know, there's a cast of thousands, writers, politicians, historical figures. Did, did we need a, a kind of like a glossary at the back? And we decided that, that, that really if the way that Platt describes um, all of these people, it's kind of self-sufficient within his narrative. He gives you enough for you to understand what he, what he, what he wants to kind of communicate about this figure. And I, my feeling is not to patronize readers. If readers want to find out more, well, let them Google. Um, <laughs> I mean, I had this argument, I don't, you know, Dalkey Archive Press? Do you, do you know the Dalkey Archive Press? I had a, a very big argument with Dalkey Archive over my translation of Juan the Landless by Juan Goitisolo. Jeremy Davis, the editor there, he kind of edited my translation. It came back covered in ink, you know, red ink. And I, you know, and I, I kind of worked over all of his kind of, and basically he was, he was saying, well, I don't understand all these references that Goitisolo makes. And you know, can you clarify them for me? And I, and I kind of, ha in the end, um, I just kind of wrote back to, to John O'Brien and said, you know, it's not my job to clarify all of this. You know, if, if the reader wants to find out about it, then the reader can kind of do all the work that I did in order to create the translation. It's not my job to create to create a kind of critical apparatus uh, and, uh, and, uh, and an aid to the to, 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 to the weak reader. And, and so I just kind of rejected the edit, and John O'Brien kind of accepted my rejection of the edit. Um, and that's, that's, I've only had one kind of um, experience like that in, in all the kind of translations I've done. Um, 
I think that if, you, if you're translating a difficult writer, then that writer is going to be difficult in the translation and has to be difficult in the translation. And the readers that go to read that kind of book want that experience. I mean, they want that kind of struggle. Um, and, and if you, if, you, um, if you put in a kind of great number of footnotes and that kind of apparatus, you put off readers as well. I mean, I'm not, I'm not opposed to... I think nowadays, even trade publishers are more, more accepting of, of introductions and prologues. I mean, for instance, with Uncertain Glory, it was edited by the, the man who um, used to be the chief editor of Penguin India. And he read it, and he, he kind of liked the translation, he, he really adored the book. And he said, the problem is there are all these references to different kinds of anarchism. And, uh, you know, I don't understand... Uh, you know. What, he said it would be handy to have like a, a prologue describing briefly the historical background. So I discussed it with, with Christopher McElhurst and I wrote, I wrote a kind of short, short prologue. And, and I'm, not, I'm not opposed to that. No. Peter, I have a question yes. on, the, on the role of translation in national literatures. Sure. Uh, because Pla is writing at a time when there, there is also a movement to create a, a certain number of institutional projects uh, related to the dignification and the institutionalization of Catalan as, as a language, as a literary language. That's right. The Swiss Catalans is yes. in the early 19th, 20th century. That's right. But one, one of, the, of the aspects of this project is the promotion of translation as a way of bringing works from uh, world literature into Catalan. Yeah. Right? Um, is Pla aware of this? At the time he's writing the, the Quadern Gris, and does he mention or does he make a reference to this? And the other part of the question would be, what do you think about the role of translation in the development of minority, uh, so-called minority? Well, I, you know, I, I think that translation is very important in the in the development of minority languages, and it's very different, very important in the development of literary Catalan. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no doubt about that. And translation is continues to be very difficult, very important in the development of Catalan. I think that Pla. Um, I mean, he, he, th th these developments were later on, weren't they, in the 1920s mm -hmm. and the early 30s. And I think that um, <coughs> he was not... I mean, he was, a, he was in Europe, so he wasn't in Barcelona for, 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 that, for most of that time. And, I mean, I've not read the 46 volumes of his complete works, but so from what I've read of... Um, I mean, there's a continuation of the Grey Notebook, which is called... Notas dispersas, like scattered notes. I mean, it's the same as the Grey Notebook, but it's much less kind of unified. And in that, there's no, there's no, as far as I remember, there's no kind of reference to these official Catalan bodies. I mean, I think that he was very suspicious of these bodies because I think he, I mean, he felt that they were the, <coughs> they were the like normalizing, and he was very suspicious of the Catalan literary establishment. I think um, he didn't. He didn't get on well with the with the with the literary establishment. He kind of he t and he tends to make fun of them. Um, there's a there's a there's a there's a short story in in uh, Life and Bitters as La Vida Amarga will be called, in which he's dis he he's in he's in Berlin, and uh, he and his friend have got um, they have a flat and it's the period of hyperinflation and the the mark has been stabilised. And they've suddenly found that all their kind of foreign currencies don't work anymore in terms of giving them a great standard of living. So they, they did, his friend says, Shamar, another important Catalan journalist, his friend Shamar says, well, what we have to do is we have to create social life. We have to have people coming in. And that, if we have lots of people from this district in, in Berlin coming to our house for parties, we will kind of generate income because they will give us jobs and work and so on and so forth. And then they do this, but they, they do it too successfully. And, and, and uh, his friend says that the problem with this, we've got too many people coming to our parties now. We need to, cut, we need to kind of put people off. What is, what is the way to put people off? Is well, what we need is to, we, we, need, we should invite one or two boring professors. And if we, if we invite one or two boring impress, professors, then people will not come anymore. And so one, one of these boring professors is, uh, is a, he's a German who is a, a Hispanist. And, and Plas says, oh, this Hispanist, he speaks, he speaks such excellent Spanish, such perfect Spanish, it's so grammatically correct, so boring. Uh, and I think that, he's kind of, he's also, there's a, there's a story set in Lisbon, and he, he kind of reflects back to going to the theater in, in, uh, in Barcelona, and there's a performance by a, a Portuguese um, theater group, that, that I can't remember what they're performing. 
And he says, well, all these people, all these Catalans were in the audience. And of course, they're, they're Catalans and they, they know Spanish and they know French. They thought they could kind of understand Portuguese. And these Portuguese kind of actors start talking and they don't, they don't understand anything. And there's, he says, you have this feeling that all of a sudden the, the audience was going to erupt against what was happening on stage. But it didn't happen. You know, it, after five minutes, it passes. And the Catalan audience kind of adapts to what's happening on stage. And they like the drama, even though they're finding it very difficult to understand, to understand the Portuguese. And, he, and he's, he's kind of reflecting on this while he's walking down the main street in, uh, in Lisbon. And he says, well, when I, when I kind of learned Portuguese, I learned Portuguese in the street. And what my Portuguese may not be a very correct Portuguese, but it's the Portuguese that people around me are speaking. And I think he always, he, he sees it, he, I think because of his experience in the university as well, he had this very anti-academic thing because the quality of kind of academic life in, in Spain at the time was so poor that he, he kind of, um, he was put off ac academics. And German academics also tended to be very, very pompous. So he didn't like the German, the German variety of academic either. <laughs> Sorry. I have a question about the process of translation. Yeah. Um, do you think not in the case of Flat, <laughs> when the author is alive, so you are incorporating, <laughs> or do you like to wait to see? I, I know that Francis Sinatra, you know, for example, now he's very happy he's working with. I'm not sure. Who? Francis Pinot. Oh, right, yes. And he said that he's very happy doing that. I'm not sure if the translators are happy with him. Well, there are publishers who don't like you to. I tried to put you off working with them. My, my position on that is that I always try and collaborate with the author. I always send, you know, I consult with the author, and I always say, well, if you want to read the translation, here it is. And you get different responses. Some 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 writers don't know English, so they, they they can only answer queries. I've never found an author who's not prepared to kind of answer queries. And with Juan Guatisola, for instance, I mean, he used to read my translation and, and kind of make annotations, and um, that was fine. I mean, he was very helpful. He kind of saw things that I had. I mean, there were things that I hadn't seen that he wanted me to highlight. So I've never I've never had a major. I mean, when I, I translated Onetti, you know, the uh, great Uruguayan writer, Juan Carlos Onetti, um, I translated him after I translated uh, Goiti Sola's autobiography. And uh, it, that, I had, that was an interesting experience because Onetti was um, in exile, and he was in exile in Madrid, and he lived on the, on the road that goes out to the Baracas airport. And I, I would send my, my final drafts to, to Onetti, and then I would go over to Madrid and spend a kind of long weekend working with working in the Onetti flat, um, and that was an interesting experience. But on but I wasn't working with Onetti. Because, well, you, I, you, if you're not familiar with Onetti, um, for the last well from the age of I don't know about forty, he he really didn't get out of bed. He spent his life in bed, and he wrote in bed, he read in bed, he smoked in bed, and he drank whiskey in bed, and no doubt did other things in bed as well. Um, but um, that was his life. And I, when I, the first visit to his flat, I mean, his, his wife, Dolly, she, she was a cello player in the, in the Madrid, in the Spanish symf symphony orchestra. And uh, basically what, what happened with, his, with, with my drafts is that I worked with Dolly, his wife, because his wife had been educated in one of these um, Anglo-Argentine private schools in Buenos Aires where you know, they speak very kind of upper, upper crust English. Um, and so... I would send my manuscripts to, to the Onetti household. I would then go over to Madrid, and I would work in the front room in the flat with, with Dolly. And I, I only once went into the bedroom and, and, and met Juan Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, if there was a problem, I mean, I mean we, Dolly and I would kind of be talking, and there might be a problem, and she had, there was like a bell, and she would kind of ring this bell, and then she would go into the... Uh, to Juan Carlos's bedroom and, and say, you know, well, what about it, Juan Carlos? You know, <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, sometimes he would say, you know, que you? you know, but how, how do I know? I wrote that like in 1939. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. Um, but that, you know, I mean, that kind of um, conversation was very important for me because 
you know, when you're translating books that were written in kind of 1939, 1940 in Montevideo, you know, there are, there are bound to be like colloquialisms, contemporary references that you don't get and that you, it's difficult to kind of research or even think that you, you know, to think that you need to research something. And it was useful having Dolly's kind of reflections on that. But I had, with her, I had to guard against the, the question of English register but because she, she had such upper class English that it wasn't appropriate for his books that by and large are set in brothels. You know, it wasn't the kind of the right, la the right language. Or also <laughs> kind of intellectuals, kind of, kind of um, existentialist intellectuals arguing about the kind of life and so on in, in kind of in the, on the Rio Plata in the 1940s. It wasn't appropriate. So that was one I mean, experience. And another kind of interesting experience I had with a writer was with um, Chico Buarque. Do you know Chico Buarque? Chico Buarque is, uh, is described as like the John Lennon of Brazil. I mean, he's a great sing singer and is a poet. Um, and he just wanted to be a writer. And he'd always wanted to be a writer. And he's, he's now written, I think, about five novels. And I translated his first novel, Estorvo, for Bloomsbury. And he, he kind of treated this novel like a baby. He didn't want to let go of it. And uh, he came over to, to Europe, and he worked a week with his French translator, a week with his Italian translator, and he worked with a, a week with me. And basically, um, Bloomsbury booked a room in the... I mean, he was staying at Brown's Hotel, which is a very kind of, um, kind of posh hotel in, 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 in London. And they, they kind of, we had a room... In, in, in Brown's hotel, and we would go, you know, I would go there at two o'clock in the afternoon because he's, he's a singer, so he doesn't start functioning until two o'clock in the afternoon. And he would, we'd go there at two o'clock and we'd work through, we worked through the novel sentence by sentence until 10 o'clock at night. Um, and on the last night, we worked there on, on, on until half past one in the morning, and, and he had to book me a room in the hotel because I couldn't possibly go home that night. Um, and it was very intense. That was a very kind of intense experience, um, and very. It was very rewarding, but at times it was um, it, it was conflict because I didn't agree with him because he had he had, he had these dictionaries, the kind of standard Portuguese English dictionaries, and he say, "Look, the word here it says this, and that's like the Portuguese. Why can't you use the English word that's more like the Portuguese?" And I said, "Because it sounds ridiculous. It's a word that people don't use anymore. It's it's kind of archaic." Um, but on the other hand, I mean, he helped me a lot with the translation. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's uh, it's uh, it's always um, interesting to work with with authors. I think it's a it's all every experience with a new publishing house is an adventure because you're never quite sure how they're going to edit your work. Um, even though, if you try and kind of find out beforehand how they get it's. It, you, know, you don't actually know until you, you get kind of responses from editors and so on. So the idea that, that translation is like a boring, solitary existence, I think, you know, for, as a professional, now a professional kind of full-time literary translator, I don't think that translation is, you know, it's, it's never boring because, and it's never that this kind of solitary, I mean, there are, obviously there are long hours that you spend by yourself with the text, but um, there are also these kind of interactions at many levels that make, uh, that kind of make it a fascinating uh, creative activity. Um, sorry. Are there other people are connected to the authors who are important in your translation? Like, you were talking about not talking to the authors or your editor can be helpful, but is there like anything about them that is then particularly helpful or are there like other people in your life who you can talk to? How do you mean other people in my life? Oh, I see what you mean. Oh no, well, uh, you, no, it's a, it's a, it's a good point. No, I mean, I, I well, I, I mean, I'm, I, I live with a writer who's a Catalan writer, and you know, I'm always we and she, we always talk about what she's writing and what I'm translating, and so there's a constant discussion. I will say, oh, I'm, yeah, you know, I mean, sometimes she'll kind of react as I'm oh, not, not more, no, not more plat, you know, not more, you know, I mean, but, but you. But I mean, it's inevitable that if you're kind of working on something like this, it's a subject of it becomes a, a kind of subject of conversation. And we have an 11-year-old an daughter, and she kind of takes part in these discussions as well. And and and, uh, and you have friends, you know. Yes, you have friends. But but um, I think that you know that 
editing, I mean, uh, there's nothing like having a very good editor because it's a very specialized thing. To be able to react, I mean, it, to be able to react to somebody's English that is a translation from another language and react sensitively to kind of the interpretive move, moves that have been made by a translator, that's a, it's a very kind of special thing. Um, and there are a lot of very good, or, uh, there are a lot of very good editors, and there are some bad editors as well. And there are some non-editors, you know. Sometimes a book will go through and they'll say, no, it goes through on the nod. Um, so I would say that I think this, on the whole, that the specialist, uh, the, the kind of the specialist editors, they're, they're the, 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 the most kind of helpful people. I mean, you can ask friends, you know, specific questions about, about a book that you're translating and they may be able to help you. But uh, I don't have... I mean, I mean, for instance, Margaret Jewel Costa, do you know Margaret Jewel Costa? Well, I mean, you know, everything that Margaret translates, her husband reads, Ben. So she has somebody who kind of reads every word and, and, makes, and makes comments. So I don't have anybody like that. So I, 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 that's why I like to work with, you know, if, if somebody like the, 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 the writer's wife is prepared to read my translations, and I know that she's very familiar with his work, and is, she knows all about his work, then that, that's very useful for me to have that kind of, those the comments from somebody like that. Yeah. Um, it's, um, <clears throat> I think that um, the issue of, I mean, I've had conversations with, uh, I mean, I won't mention names, but there's a, you know, with the press, with one publisher, for instance, um, and in the end, I never worked with. But you know, she she was saying that, um, well, of course, most readers of of translations are literary upper middle class uh, people, and in England they live in North London, <laughs> and so you've therefore got to adapt your translation to that kind of register, and you know and that. that I mean, I can see that, you know, from a marketing point of view, it might seem, it might seem, you know, it, it, it could might seem kind of sensible, but from a literary point of view, it seems like the death of literature that you <laughs> uh, to to kind of uh, to to translate in a way for a kind of that kind of that in using that kind of um, approach, but you know that some that that's what a publisher has said to me. Um, Should I translate it in that way? Well, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, but that, I mean, I mean, I, I should say also, of course, that publishers have their do have their values. And, and for instance, I, I've 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 translated a lot for Serpent's Tale. Don't know if you know the publishing house in London, Serpent's Tale, which is now part of Profile Books with Peter Ayrton. And Peter Ayrton doesn't like books set in the countryside. So if you have a book, if you have a <laughs> You know, I mean, he's he's published a book on Provence, which like, which is like a satire <coughs> on Provence. But you, but you, you knew, you know, I knew that if I had a book that was set in the countryside, you wouldn't take that book to uh, to Pete Ayrton. But if you had something like Najat Al Hashmi, the Moroccan Catalan I mentioned, something gritty, sexy, kind of urban uh, tensions and so on, uh, well, you can take that to Pete Ayrton, and then he will lap it up at Serpent's Tail. Um, I had an experience. The, there's the Peruvian writer called Jaime Baile, a gay uh, Peruvian writer. Who I, so I think some of his novels are really great, and I tried early on to to um, to get. I know I failed to find a publisher for them. I don't know if he's been translated, but um, uh, Ma the Macclehose Press, in, in, in an earlier kind of incarnation, was uh, was the Harvill Press, and. Uh, they actually sent me a, a Baile novel to, to write a report on, and I wrote a report on it, very, a very positive report. And it was about him discovering that he was gay, and, and, and he came from this very kind of Catholic, um, uh, a rich Catholic background in, in Lima. So kind of, he was at odds with his family. And, the, and, the, and the, well, several of his novels are about that experience, but I think the, the, um, the, f the first novel that he wrote about that, I think, is the best novel. And I wrote a very positive report. I thought it was a very interesting novel. And I got this, uh, got this reply from uh, Guido Waldman. Guido Waldman is a great translator of Italian, of Dante and so on, but a, a, a kind of Catholic. You know, uh, uh, 
And he wrote back, um, this sounds very interesting, but not the kind of thing that we would want to publish. <laughs> <laughs> and for instance, when, when Jose Saramago, Jose Saramago has a novel that is a um, St. Matthew. I mean, it's a kind of, you know, when, when, it, was, when it was published, the, the Catholics in, in Portugal, they kind of demonstrated against the novel and so on. Guido Waldman refused to edit that book. He wouldn't edit that book because it was a, it offended his faith. Well, fair enough, but um, you know the, the, these these are surprising reactions. You don't I mean, uh, in a way. Yeah. Yes, you have to make make that match. Um, well, perhaps we could continue this conversation over wine and let that. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Someone Fine. in the room. <laughs> <laughs> but first, I thank Peter for the for the lecture. This is the third. Lecture uh, in, 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 yes. this today, so it's well, thank you very much for coming. Despite well, the sh it's not stopped snowing, so we'll get home. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.